Welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abit Chonistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong strategic national security oriented policies. Our movement consists of more than 20,000 people in Israel, primarily reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense Establishment, who believe that strong national security priorities and staunch Zionism are necessary for Israel to be the eternal homeland of the Jewish people. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into these war briefings. It is very important to us at IDSF to share with you war updates and analysis from experts here in Israel through these very direct and candid briefings. We are joined today by Dr. Gadi Taub, radio show host, author, political commentator, much more. It's a great pleasure Gadi, to be able to chat with you right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Moshe. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's let's just jump right into it. Um, my first question I'd like to ask you, and by the way, for all of our listeners, I'm going to throw Gadi's um, podcast, uh, his, uh, his regular Israel update in English, into the chat so everyone can uh, check it out and feel free, of course, to subscribe to that. Uh, but let's jump right into it. Uh, do you think that the U.S. is slowing down or placing impediments on Israel's war effort? Absolutely. Um, I think we in Israel um, are, are have a sentimental view of the United States, and we don't pause uh, to ask what is the strategic outlook of the uh, Biden administration and what's its regional policy. And the regional policy of this administration is a continuation of Obama's uh, regional policy, which uh, uh, my my colleague and co-host to the Israel Update show, Mike Duran, along with Tony Badran, Mike from the Hudson Institute and Tony from FDD, have called the realignment. The idea being that, that the problems in the region stem from the fact that an alliance of pro-Western states have pushed Iran and backed it into a corner. And what we should do is uh, make them stakeholders and allow them to take their proper place on the Middle East stage. This is a progressive view in which uh, resentment of the West is always our fault. It's not because they really hate the West. It's because we did something wrong to them, colonialism, uh, CIA coup or something else. So th that's the, the general outlook. And this has not been working because the uh, with the exception of the four Trump years for the last almost two decades, uh, the United States is helping along the drive of of the mullahs from Tehran to regional hegemony. This is the, the, the nuclear deal, the JCPOA is part of that, but it's not the only part. And now the Biden administration has released huge sums of money to, uh, to Tehran. And this is the background of what happened in Hamas because Hamas is one of Iran's proxies, right? They, Iran is trying to circle Israel with proxies. So we have Hamas, we have Hezbollah in the North, we now have Syria, Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen and Hamas in in the south, and and uh, uh, the, the 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 first thing that I think the Americans thought about is how to prevent this war from collapsing the system of alliance and that 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 the, the, their policy of appeasement, and and how to save that that policy from. Uh, the the collateral damage of this war. So the Biden administration first sought to localize this war. This war is trouble for them because it shows that the policy failed, because it shows that their policy emboldened Iran's proxies. So th the first thing the administration did, it was very lucky for us because the interest here converged. Uh, is the administration sent a, an aircraft carrier, right, to the Eastern Mediterranean to deter Hezbollah. This was very good for Israel um, because our fear was a two-front war, and, and that seemed to have a, a very good chilling effect. But as I said at the time, and Israelis did not want to listen, this aircraft carrier is here to prevent the spread of the war in order to save the appeasement policy. Because if this war spreads 
to the north, then it would be clear to everyone on the world stage, and especially to American voters, that the policy has failed. Biden has continued to un to unfreeze um, uh, Iranian assets from October seven up to now. They haven't they haven't stopped. The appeasement is continuing. So the interest. The Israeli interest and the American interest converge for a while, but is but it's Israel's interest to take out Hezbollah, and it's clear to me. I just this morning spoke with a with a, a very prominent expert. I'm not I'm not allowed to quote him. It was off the record, who said, "Look, the this administration will never let Israel initiate a war with Hezbollah." Now think, uh, Moshe, about our perspective, our Zionist perspective, we had had to evacuate the north of the country because of the threat of Hezbollah. How are we going to repopulate our towns and villages without taking out Hezbollah? Um, Israel, I hope, is waking up from its own conceptions, you say? Uh, uh, preconception, I guess, you know, we in Hebrew say conceptia. It's a Yom Kippur term how, of the in, intelligence failure, but it's in English, it's preconception. And our whole predisposition, if I may introduce another long word, was ever since perhaps the 70s, defensive, while the original Ben-Gurion conception of security was offensive. You go out and hunt your enemies. You don't build a higher wall and hope that it will defend you. But we've been building iron domes and slurry walls and, and, and creating all these mechanisms, which are all defensive. And when you have an offensive enemy, in the long run, they have the advantage. And Israel must destroy Hezbollah at some point. And this is, and you'll see, America is not going to is not going to let us do that. And now Blinken was here, and Blinken sat in on sat in on the cabinet meeting, which I find very strange. You know, he he, he did it like like the Godfather, as if as, as if you know this is he can meet with our foreign minister. That's the right protocol. But he came here like. Can you hear me, Moshe? We lost your video, but I hear you for sure. Yeah. So my Here video. Back. Back. Uh, okay. So, uh, so I'm back. Um, so he sat on like like uh, the like the uh, like the the Roman prefect for southern Syria uh, for the southern Syria region in uh, I don't know the first century of the. Uh, of the, the first millennium. And, and he dictated basically limits to the ways we can conduct the war. And if you listen to what he said, he said, avoid civilian casualties, do not, um, do not bomb UN facilities. While we know that they're hiding their weapons in UNRWA schools and other UN facilities, uh, do not move populations around. And when, according to leaks, uh, Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant said, Israel is united behind crushing Hezbollah and winning this war, even if it takes months, Blinken said, you don't have months, you have weeks. And within these limitations, weeks means that we will not be able to win this war. So the United States now, it seems, is eager to end this war before Israel can achieve victory. This means our blood would stain the water for all the bigger sharks to smell. Wow, okay, so you're, you're certainly um, suggesting Israel needs to be on the offensive, more aggressive and take it to the mm -hmm. end. So- Yeah, but, but I'll say more, so, sorry for stopping you because I think, Moshe, we are now back in 1956. And so, so I'll, I'll briefly paint this picture for you. From 1955, when Nasser had this huge arms deal with the Soviets, Israel felt that, that the radical leader of the Arab world, Gamal Abdel Nasser of, of Egypt, is creating a ring around us in order to, to, uh, to destroy 
this the state of Israel. And it took a few wars, 56, the Suez War, um, 67, the Six Day War, the War of Attrition, and then the Yom Kippur War to finally reach the agreement with Egypt in 1979, two decades and a little more than two decades in order to break the encirclement ring. That's how long it took. So now we are in 56, and this is the Suez War. This is just the first phase in what is bound to be a long struggle to release Israel from the noose that Iran is trying to tie around our neck. And this tells you how out of touch Blinken's remarks are. He's talking about weeks, and we need to think about decades. We need to now strategically plan a way to break the noose that is surrounding us, masterminded by Iran, and finally take out Iran's nuclear, um, uh, military nuclear <clears throat> program. So this is where I think we are. Weeks doesn't even begin to capture it. So you recently, you sat down with Tzvika Moore um, to discuss the hostage situation. And I think, he, I've heard him speak, he's amazing. And I think he provides a perspective that much of our American audience may not be familiar with, which I think fits into what you're suggesting. Are you able to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I spoke I spoke with, with uh, Tzvika Mo first on the radio, and I was astounded by the, the moral and spiritual strength of this man. He is the father of Eitan Mo, who is held now by Hamas. Um, and he said to me in the podcast, he said, he said, a few months before uh, Eitan was, was taken hostage by Hamas, uh, we had a conversation about the Gilad Shalit deal in which Israel returned about 1,000 ter terrorists for one soldier hostage. And Eitan, his son, said, Dad, if I'm ever kidnapped, don't release terrorists for me. Don't release terrorists for me. And now... His son is kidnapped, and Zvika is insisting that we should not go for hostage deals. And uh, that we should not, because he said to me, he said, it's not true that there were 240 hostages and now 140. There are 7 million hostages. We all, we Israelis are all hostages of Hamas now, and we need to take Hamas out. We can't run national policy based on the fate of 140 people while the fate of 7 million people is hanging in the balance. And, you know, everybody thinks so, um, or, or at least quietly. But to hear this openly from a father, while all the other parents around him are blinded by pain. And I can't blame them for this. I can't blame them for this. Some of these people say, I will do anything to release my son. And, and Tzvika said, he asked them, anything? Would you destroy the state of Israel for that? And, and that gave them pause, but they couldn't quite answer it. Because for some people, you know, I, I would give my life, I would give everybody's life to save my my son. That's that's the natural emotion, but hopefully, natural emotion is restrained by culture. It is restrained by rationality. It is restrained by moral responsibility and moral training, and it is restrained by by the 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 collective moral fiber of a people. And now we are a week away, less than a week away from Hanukkah. And, and it's time to abandon what one of, when I, when I started studying the United States, my PhD is in American history. I read this book by cultural critic, Philip uh, Riff, Reef. And Philip Reef wrote a book called Culture, The Culture of the Therapeutic, in which we attend to everyone's uh, inner needs, and we listen to every, uh, he didn't use the word trigger, but uh, he, he referred to the same phenomena, and, and, and we just assume that we can create a safe space for everybody to live in and never be offended and all that, and we should 
we should turn our backs on this and, and look back at the Maccabees, where Matityahu told uh, his relatives, you come to me crying about one of my sons being killed. But the fate of a nation, I'm paraphrasing, the fate of a nation is hanging in the balance. And this is what we need to focus on. So we need the spirit of the Maccabim, who are admittedly uh, fanatics. But it, when you when you have to face someone like Hezbollah, a uh, force like Hezbollah with absolutely no moral scruples, you need to be tough. So Tzvika said to me, look, we are saying, bring them back, bring them back. There's a whole campaign all over Israel. He said, if I even buy a, 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 a used electric scooter, I don't let the other side know how much I want it. Let alone when we are fighting for the lives of our sons. And here we are with a campaign. This is a campaign of the left designed to weaken the government because it's part of a plan. These people, you have to understand that when they say that Netanyahu is a worse enemy than Iran, they mean it. Their skewed vision of the world is clouded by hatred for Netanyahu, which is irrational. It's like the it's like the never Trumpers. It's like it blinds their eyes. They're just, they go mad with anger. And so, for many of them, Hamas is an opportunity to get rid of Netanyahu. I, I'm almost quoting Haaretz here. Uh, which, which I hope, I hope will suffer economically from this crisis because we all saw that this is one of the most effective anti-Israeli propaganda machines worldwide. Perhaps more, more useful to anti-Semites even than the UN. So, so when, when, when we are faced with, 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 with that kind of conspiratorial thinking that Netanyahu is the, the, the devil incarnate. Their calculation is we can use the hostage issue in order to prevent Israel from complete victory, which will cause Netanyahu to fall. And if you think this is too cynical for these people, you are wrong because one of their ringleaders was there organizing the parents of the hostages in the afternoon of October 7, that early, he had a plan how to topple the government. Gadi, I have a really important question I want to ask you based on something you sp spoke about this morning on your radio show. But before I do that, uh, we do have Brigadier General Amir Avivi here with us. So I wanna, I'm going to go to General Avivi and I want to come back to you for this important question. General Avivi, are you able to share a little bit of an update of what is happening right now yeah. in Gaza. Actually, I want to ask Gadi a question. Yeah, please like, do, uh, Amir. The, yeah. Uh, first, Gadi, you talked about the Maccabees. I think that the Bitchonist team are, you know... The, the new Maccabees. Re really, really aligned with the uh, Maccabees values. Um, you, you talked about uh, uh, Biden's uh, policy um, and, and, and you compared it to Obama's. But in the last few months, we saw a change. We saw this administration completely changing its policy uh, from uh, looking at uh, Saudi Arabia really in detest, I would say, really detesting this uh, country as an opportunity to build an alliance, an American-Israeli-Sunni alliance that can a counter um, this uh, rising uh, Iranian, Russian, possibly Chinese front. And also, so this uh, war, America, you know, it's Biden saying, don't intervene, not China, not Israel. Yeah. So, we are seeing some kind of change. I want to, to understand how you view this change of policy. Why is it happening? What's exactly this change? And does it give us any opportunities looking at the day after Hamas, providing, of course, that we actually destroy Hamas? Yep. Well, that's a very interesting question, and I'm not sure I have a complete answer. I would just, I, Because I think that the American policy has internal contradictions. But I would point out the fact that Biden keeps on freezing funds for the Iranians as we speak. So my interpretation is that the, 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 concern, the concern of the Biden administration is a total collapse of their Middle East policy in a war. 
So what it seeks to prevent is a war with Iran, because if there's an Israeli-Iranian war, the United States will be dragged into it and it would have to defend Israel in one way or the other. So, so their policy is trying to balance their appeasement towards Iran. And, and note, Amir, Iran keeps attacking them and they barely answer. There have been more than 50 attacks on American forces in Iraq and Syria. I think this week or day, this week we saw in Kharkouk, we saw one maybe yeah, yeah. bigger attack. They, they, but you are right overall, yeah. They, they keep at it. And the Biden administration keeps unfreezing funds. And so the, there, there are convergences between Israeli policy and American policy. But the larger policy is not, is not strayed so far from Obama's policy. And the people running it are Obama personnel. And and so, and and this fits very well with 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 Blinken uh, coming here and basically telling us, Amir, correct me if I'm wrong, basically laying out limits that would not enable that would not let us win this war, if we abide by the restriction Blinken uh, suggests, then 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 we can't take out Hamas, can we? Yeah, I think that um, you're right. I'm I'm not sure they're completely saying uh, don't move at all society. They are definitely are under a lot of pressure talking about uh, humanitarian issues. Uh, I mean, you know, this is elections here. I mean, uh, yeah. it's obvious that uh, there is a lot of pressure on Biden uh, when it comes to um, the, the Palestinian society in Gaza. And this is really a question how strongly the cabinet can stand. And, you know, at the end of the yeah. day for us, really, as you said, this is an existential uh, war. If we Absolutely. don't win against Hamas, we'll be attacked from all over. Yeah, and, and so I, I completely agree. We have to we have to stand firm on this. And I'd also recommend to your listeners uh, to to look at what I think is the most brilliant piece written on this explaining the American policy. It's a piece called The Realignment, uh, written by my my colleague Mike Duran. And if and if you want to follow the the vicissitudes of American policy, we discuss this twice a week on our show on Rumble called Israel Update. And Moshe will, will send you the link because Mike is probably Mike has been saying this for about a decade, and people have been saying, nah, come on, that can't be. And he has been proven right. He has been proven right on most points. So I, I, I sincerely recommend. Oh, Gadi, I want to ask you another question. Sure. I mean, we see uh, when Biden came to Israel, he was really bothered about world trade, the crisis of, you know, um, uh, goods not arriving to the U.S. and so on. And then he started talking about this new route the, from India to UAE and uh, through Saudi Arabia, Jordan to Israel. He talked about it again in the G20 when he started pushing the peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. And now we see these attacks by the Houthis, uh, of course, uh, directed by Iran. We see world trade being affected. See a British uh, uh, ship attacked. And um, how much do you think it might affect the overall view of the U.S. and the West, I mean, of what Iran really is and what kind of threat they impose to a uh, world trade, to, to the West overall, and their aspiration yeah. to hegemony in our region and maybe far beyond, you know, where we see them even yeah. in Morocco. So, so Amir, they're, they're basically... They're... I think there are basically two clocks yeah. running here, and the, the 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 Israeli clock we face existential danger, and the American clock when will America wake up to the collapse or the the the, the um, failure of their their uh, regional policy? Then there's the first clock on when when will Europe uh, or the West in general wake up to the threat of, of radical Islam. And these clocks are not necessarily synchronized, but if our, we, should, we should do our best to help the United States wake up too. And here, there, there, I think there's room for maneuver because 
while the administration is very progressive and thinks of Iran in these terms I described, the American public decidedly sides with Israel over Iran. Americans don't like the mullahs from Iran and they are partial to Israel. So the question is, do we have any wiggle room if we start making louder noises? Like, for instance, saying explicitly that uh, Biden, uh, Biden's administration is going to save uh, Hamas uh, from, from destruction. And I think that would not be very popular with the American with the American public. So I'm asking myself, is there a way that we could do it without without a full break with the the Democratic administration? And I think and I but think But don't you think ways. that uh, the administration wants Hamas <laughs> destroyed? Not for the reasons we want them destroyed. They they want Hamas destroyed because they see them as a hurdle on the way to a two state solution. Right, but 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 I'm beginning to think that they are because Biden said at one time he said the radicals of Hamas about something as if there are you know Hamas radicals and Hamas uh, moderates. So I the, I'm I I think that as this war is getting progressively uh, difficult to defend for the left wing of their constituency, they are losing patience and. And I think they're slowly moving to some idea of a weakened Hamas, which, which they may imagine would would accept the authority of the Palestinian uh, uh, Palestinian Authority. But the, you know, progressives progressives don't understand fanaticism because for all of their talk of diversity, they, at their hearts of hearts, believe that everyone is fundamentally like them. So this is why Barack Obama said that, you know, in the end, the Palestinians, they are like us. They want their children to grow up with no threats. They want to come home in the evening. They want to they, they want to make a living and have uh, uh, food on the table. And 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 we ac accepted this and are, you know, all y y your your former colleagues in in the I'm sorry, very unimpressive. They're not like you, uh, Amir. They, they don't. They they haven't looked at reality afresh. And they also thought that Hamas is deterred. Why is Hamas deterred? Because as our chief of intelligence said, uh, General Aaron Khalifa, he said the 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 Hamas will not give up the economic advantages of the Hudna of the long ceasefire. And so they are deterred. And this was the misconception because we don't listen to them as the Americans don't listen to the mullahs in Tehran who mean what they say. When they say death to America, this is not propaganda. This is their actual wish. Right. So maybe I'll give uh, one important update. Um, as we know, one of the main strongholds of Hamas in the north, northern part of Gaza is Jibalia. Many of the terrorists that uh, fought in the different parts while the IDF was uh, taking over the north, they retreated to Jibalia camp. And uh, the IDF announced that it started its uh, offensive uh, attack with uh, Division 162 on Jibalia. So this uh, will probably be a very tough uh, fight because it's a real uh, stronghold. Um, we have seen massive uh, air force attacks and artillery in the last two days in this area, and also uh, in the area of Hanunes in the south. So it seems that the IDF is preparing to uh, its ground incursion also uh, into the heart of uh, Hanunes. So, as far as uh, the IDF and our government, uh, it seems that uh, we are resolute to really achieve the goals of war and destroy Hamas. But of course, as Gadi said, it's not at all weeks as maybe people would wish. It's many months and possibly years afterwards to really stabilize the, this place and destroy and dismantle all the terror infrastructure that uh, we are finding there that is unbelievable. It's, it's really on a massive scale and uh, requires a lot of time uh, to deal with. 
Uh, Moshe, you want to ask uh, one last question before we wrap it up? Uh, there are so many questions that are coming in. Our viewers are very much intrigued by this conversation. Gadi, thank you so much for joining us. Gadi, I told you there was a question I had. We have no time for it. So I'm going to ask you, you'll give me one, as one sentence leader, and then people are going to have to tune into your own podcast for the fuller discussion, which is something you spoke about this morning in terms of the growth in, of intolerance and anti-Semitism on university campuses in America, which is a very important issue to many of our viewers. Can you give a one sentence, a teaser of what you think about that? And then we'll refer everyone uh, to your podcast for more. Okay, I just saw someone asked about the what the the uh, 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 article I referred to. It's called "The Realignment" by Mike Duran and Tony Vadran, and it's on the Tablet Magazine. Um, you know, twenty five years ago, I wrote a book about the rise of the beginning of postmodern influence in academia, and I said it was a disaster. The book became a bestseller, but the but the general criticism was, "What are you talking about? Why do we have to listen to these?" these anti-Western crazies at the, the margins of some academic department. And lo and behold, they've conquered academia. Uh, and I'm glad that Jews in America are beginning to wake up. People who contributed money to Harvard University suddenly see that their Jewish kids can't go to uh, safely on campus there. So I think that is a major, major uh, struggle. And, and you're right, we, we'll have to discuss this on our podcast too. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll inform Mike Duran that we have to. Thank you so much, Brigadier General Miravidi. Thank you so much, Gadi Tab. Yeah, so Moshe, people are asking, well, you know, that people have many questions and, and we're going to do a whole session this week on Thursday, just questions. We're going to answer um, questions on, on, on Thursday and we'll dedicate the whole um, the whole time for for answering questions as we did uh, last week we, we we took one day and really focused on questions right the rapid fire question session so everyone get your questions ready for thursday we're going to just uh, charge through them thank you so much to all of our viewers for tuning in thank you to our presenters stay safe everyone stay strong take care thank you moshe goodbye bye bye